I am very, very excited here today to have Dawn Vincent, who is a director of a communications and fundraising in the Mare and Fall Sanctuary, uh, for an interview to find out more about this amazing charity. Dawn, could you just tell us why, when, and how did this charity start? Uh, this charity, the Mare and Fall Sanctuary, started in 1988 by a, a lady called Rosemary, who um, um, wanted to help injured, sick, um, unwanted ponies, um, particularly off the moors. And, um, you know, from there, we have grown into quite a considerable charity um, that operates right across the Southwest Peninsula. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's um, an incredible organisation. And I joined about a year and a, and a bit ago, um, and we have over 600 equines that we're responsible for right now, either on our sites, um, at our sanctuaries in Devon, or through our amazing rehoming scheme where people take on and loan our horses from us, um, provide their care, but they always have the protection of our sanctuary should any circumstances change, either for the equine or the owner. Wow, so right now you have about 600 horses, you were saying. And how many do you know like how many um of horses have you helped all this time so whilst we've been in lockdown um in the covid19 situation our 1000th rescue arrived into our care so 1000 horses and ponies since 1988 um she was a young foal uh, we've named uh, our supporters have named taya uh, she was actually um, born into the safety of the sanctuary. It was her mum that was rescued as part of quite a high profile rescue case um, from a, um, a well-meaning charity in North Devon. Um, and the, the owner was prosecuted for causing unnecessary suffering to animals. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a multi-agency rescue with RSPCA and World Horse Welfare and ourselves. And we agreed to take six of the equines out of the 27 that were involved in the rescue. Um, and the th and three of the mares that we brought in were in foal. So throughout COVID, we've been very lucky to have three foals born into the safety, which has just been a, a nice um, positive um, opportunity for everybody to enjoy that um, because it's been really tough. Um, the, mum, the mums, we were very worried about how, how the condition of the foals and how they might be. So Leo arrived first, um, his mum Lottie, she, they had a fine, everything went fine. And then Taylor had a little filly called Tulip a few days later. Um, and we were a little bit worried about Tulip, but within a couple of hours, she started to suckle and started to drink milk, which was really good. Um, but Taya, within hours of um, birth, um, started to so, show signs of what we thought were colic. Um, she became very sick very quickly. Um, and we ended up rushing her to um, another vet practice that has a 24-hour um, equine hospital that could deal with quite a complex case and provide that 24-7 care, given we were in lockdown. Um, but she, and she spent five days in intensive care um, wow. and then came back to us. Um, and she's doing great now. And she was our 1,000th rescue, so it really was a bit touch and go whether she was going to make it. And, and the result is the suffering that had been caused previously potentially ha had that impact on, on that unborn foal. And Taya, you know, she luckily pulled through, but thank mm. goodness for the support of our, our donors and people who, who generously donate to the charity that enabled us to just swing into action when we needed to. Wow. And that's very, very interesting. It's so challenging because horses, you know, they are really not, um, uh, not an easy animal to keep in terms of cost, in terms of space, in terms of manpower. You know, so how, how, like for me, I'm very interested, it's like, you know, for 600 horses, how much does it take to, in terms of cost, you know, to run a charity that looks after 600 horses and, you know, without a sure, obvious future of house, of homes that they're going to go to, like what sort of numbers are we talking about? 
Well, you know, we need to raise around four and a half million pounds at least a year to to continue to provide that level of care to the horses and ponies. Um, you know, we have a lot of staff that are actually looking after the equines. Um, we, we are a specialist rescue centre for um, feral ponies, um, for mares and foals. Um, and for those that are unhandleable, we have a lot of experience and skills in, in that training and um, rehabilitation of equines that have come from a abuse abuse or neglected past um, so that that's a cost to us um, giving that expertise giving that specialist care so that's that's a really significant part of of looking after the horses and ponies is the staffing mm -hmm. um, but also their feed their um, their shelters everything that comes with that um, it's a really big responsibility and obviously when there are situations like Taya, who became critically ill, um, we, you know, it's our, it's our value of kindness, care and um, knowledge. It's our, we, we will provide that the best um, for those animals, regardless of how extensive that may be, um, wherever possible. Um, and, you know, we also have to raise funds um, through fundraising and through our charity shops. So some of the money um, helps support that, but Everything we do, um, we aim to raise, you know, sufficient funds to keep to keep us going. So where, if don't mind me asking, so where does the funds come from? Like, what sort, what, what, what sort of proportion is, uh, like four and a half million? That's a lot of money. So where yeah. comes from what, so to speak? So, yeah, we're extraordinarily lucky to have a very loyal um, group of supporters who uh, are wonderful. Um, when we write to them asking for their support or explaining our work. Um, they're very generous and they send us donations. Individuals send us donations. And um, we have a lot of people who remember us in their will. So we have a lot of support from legacies, which is really important. Um, and we, we, um, we always um, acknowledge those donors um, who've remembered us in their will. Um, when we receive the funds um, in the newsletter, we always dedicate a page in our um, three month, three times a year newsletter to all the people who've remembered us and, and left something in their will. Um, and our charity shops are a really big um, source of income for us. We have six shops in Devon uh, and they are great, a great way. So people donate their pre-loved goods and then we um, obviously sell them in the, in the charity shop and that, that's a really big help as well. Wow, that is a and so tell us a little bit more about how has COVID nineteen affected you know Marion uh, in terms of income and charity shops? Yeah, so um, it's been quite difficult. Well, it's been very difficult. Firstly, our income dramatically dropped overnight with the closure of all of our charity shops uh, mm. when the government made their announcements that 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 couldn't continue for the time being. So temporarily closing all the shops had a great impact on us overnight um, so in March um, because we didn't have um, an appeal out or anything like that our money dropped out by um, a, a considerable amount and and it was quite worrying to us quite alarming uh, so we had to put out a special appeal at the um, at the end of the month um, and into April um, and we had the most amazing response on our social media to that so we're really grateful to everyone who donated and that um, appeal page is still live and um, when I last looked it was over £27,000 which is just incredible just really really grateful but obviously we're talking about raising uh, hundreds of hundreds of thousands of pounds every mm. month in order to keep to keep running so um, it's been incredibly difficult so we have um, found the government's retention job retention scheme really helpful we have over 50 percent of our staff on furlough at the moment um, mm. so what that means for all the yards is that we've got um, the, the sort of core team a minimum number of staff in to care for the horses and ponies um, so you know that that we're we're surviving um, because it's summer, or because we're we're moving into the summer, and the weather's been mm. very helpful and generous to us right now. And we've been able to turn out a lot of the horses and ponies. Um, had this have happened in the winter, it would be an extremely challenging time for us to try and manage the horse care uh, when they're sort of in their stables more and and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, we're very fortunate. It's just the good time of the year for them to be out um, and for us to have a reduced staffing whilst that happens. 
And how is the team who is still working? Uh, how are they getting on? Because uh, for obvious reasons, they probably are working really hard to cover other people's jobs or on furlough. And how are they coping with it? And you know, what sort of a uh, mechanisms have they got in place to help them out? Yeah, everybody is doing such a great job and I'm incredibly proud of everyone in the teams. Um, everyone has, we've been doing virtual coffee mornings for our supporters because we were meant to be having open days, which obviously couldn't happen. And the staff that host it from, because we go to a different sanctuary each week, uh, each fortnight. And we've been with Amy down at South Manor this morning, actually. And um, they, you know, the staff just love being with the equines and um, you know they are coping it's hard it is hard work for everybody um, and then you know as a, a senior management team we're staying in good communication with our staff and um, we've even we even have a weekly webinar so staff from the charity that are working and staff that are furloughed can all get together and catch up um, hear any information that's available um, and that's been a really big help um, and we make sure there's updates on the horses and ponies so um, yeah it's, it's, it's extremely humbling we're all here for the horses and the, and the ponies uh, and it's it's a real motivator even through the difficult times and uh, we've all just had to muck in really um, even in my team uh, where you know at least 50% of the team are furloughed you know I'm writing press releases at the moment and um, producing a little bit of film which I wouldn't normally get the chance to do I might have about 10 years ago but uh, <laughs> it's um I haven't I haven't done some of those things for a little while so we're, we're all just helping each other and that's actually been a really nice thing to do back to the horses could you just describe to us a little bit about um what does a what does a journey like look like for a horse who's just been rescued by the mare and bull? Because I understand that you have got very different locations, performing very very different specific roles. And uh, could you talk to us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah. So um, we we have um, sort of well welfare officers, if you like, or welfare advisors, um, people who are provide an, a support and advice to equine owners so anybody who owns a horse or pony if they ever want any advice or support they can give us a call and we've got our equine team who are really at the ready um, to give and impart our knowledge and experience to anybody that needs it but there are times where that that's um, we're beyond that and we're actually involved with RSPCA or a multi-agency um, rescue because we're part of the National Equine Welfare Council so we get called in to any major incidents uh, involving equines in the southwest mm -hmm. um, and in those situations we work together um, we have a, our own um, equine transport lorry so we can collect and rescue equines um, and what will happen is we'll normally they will come to our um, veterinary and welfare center beech trees which is at honeysuckle yard which is our main headquarters in newton abbott and that's a um, quarantine yard as well as a veterinary center and the horses will they'll come in and they'll be stabled individually for up to three weeks in quarantine um, and they'll be under close observation they have lots of um, tests and uh, we, we weigh them and we learn as much about their health and their condition as we can. And then from there, they tend to move on to the main yard, which is Honeysuckle, uh, where they really do specialise in, in handling unhandleable equines, which can obviously be quite challenging and sometimes mm -hmm. a bit dangerous. So dangerous, the staff yes. really, really do know what, um, how, to, how to work with these equines and how to gain their trust. Um, and yeah that you know from there we have um south manor which um sometimes is labeled as our retirement yard but basically it's it's for the elder horse or pony that has ongoing health conditions that when managed um, they can lead a really good quality of life mm -hmm. um we have um coombe park which is between um Totnes and newton abbott um mm -hmm. which used to be open to the public most of the year um, so it's very well known in the area um, and it has a large indoor riding um, arena and um, th they at Coombe Park they are sort of a rehoming centre so a lot of the horses that were available for rehoming we had there because people could visit um, and, and sort of pick but we've had 
um, some major works at Coombe Park that have meant we've had to close the centre for quite some time. Uh, and so we still have all the horses there um, and they tend to um, be the ones that are available for rehoming and also our adoption horses are there. So um, people can adopt um, five of our lovely friends. And then we have two other yards um, a little bit further up. So we have um, Yelverton, which is like our moorland rescue centre, uh, just on the outskirts of Dartmoor. And then a bit further up again, we have Upcott Park. Um, and that lends itself to more natural grazing over lots of land. So we've got a lot of the younger um, equines that have come into our care. So, for example, last year we took in a big um, rescue group um, of mares and foals and some of those youngsters are now sort of growing up at Upcott Park because it's just lovely up mm. there mm. And, and they're all being trained for rehoming uh, they all undergo training for sorts of things very very nice so how many centres is that I count five it's, it's six yeah six. but five sites if that makes sense yeah. so beech Got trees it. and honeysuckle are two centres yeah. but um, on the same site okay so, yeah I'm going to ask you a question that is quite specific and has even more challenges now because of COVID-19. So if you can just lump everything together and answer this. So basically the question is, what challenges do you see that this charity is going to have? What are the difficulties that this charity will face, including in light of COVID-19 moving on? I think one of the biggest challenges will be our income and making sure it's sustainable uh, in the future. Um, we've also, we, we rely heavily on legacy income, as I've mentioned before, and we've seen a slight um, decrease in the legacies, um, possibly because people are um, furloughed or the um, offices aren't working um, mm. as swiftly. Mm. So I hope that that's a a, a short-term issue mm. um, but the future is uncertain for most people around the world at the moment um, particularly with regards to finances so I really don't know what the future holds for all charities I think are going to have a challenging future ahead mm. um, even though the charity shops are opening I, I just wonder how long it will take before high streets mm. can get back to normal and mm feel safe to go into shops because um, I think that the COVID situation has really challenged um, just the, the everyday normal. Mm, I think so, the new normal really. Yeah and um, you know um, one of the things that we were very excited about doing this year was opening all of our sanctuaries up for the first time Mm. And COVID came along and completely um, turned that upside down. And we haven't been able to do that. And people being able to come and actually connect with our horses and ponies is really important. Um, mm. and in fact, um, we have an entire, entirely dedicated education and therapy program that is based on bringing our clients to the sanctuaries um, where it is safe for them to um, explore the site connect with the horses and ponies in ways they wish to through our structured programs. Um, and even that is, you know, not able to operate at the moment, but we hope that will, that will change soon. And, and probably my third concern or challenge that I feel we may face is a sudden influx of rescues or, or neglect cases where people have struggled over COVID-19 and haven't um, kept on top of the care of their horse or pony mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know, it's, that's a personal view that we may get a slight, um, mm. a, an increase in inquiries or rescue situations. Well, certainly I think uh, RSPCA has already mentioned that there is an increase, uh, there's going to be an increase and there is actually an increase in dogs and cats being rescued around UK because of uh, COVID. So, and, and more importantly, because uh, they were actually shut down. Uh, as in the, the charities are not taking in any more animals during COVID-19 and there's a backlog. So I can uh, appreciate yeah. that really. We, we right now are not accepting any new admissions unless it's an absolute emergency mm. because all of our yards are currently over capacity mm. because we've had to put our rehoming scheme on hold. Mm. Um, but that that's starting to reopen. Um, so we have been able to rehome some horses that were ready to go just before Good. COVID and now we're able to get those horses out. 
um, but it's not so easy for somebody who's thinking about getting a horse to come and visit and meet the horse and for us to see if they match and all, the, all of those things. So, yeah, I mean, it's affected every element, every part of our charity, um, as it has all of our lives, everybody. Mm -hmm. I've never known in my, my lifetime anything like this. I can only see it because it's almost like a double prong thing. Firstly, you cannot rehome because of COVID. And nextly, half of your team is on furlough, which means that whatever animals you have, it's hard to increase the number of horses without increasing the number of staff for the care. Uh, very challenging indeed. Very challenging indeed. Yeah. When, and I am hopeful, you know, when we get over COVID-19, I'm talking about a year from now, two years from now, what are the dreams, like what are the sort of the future of this uh, Marion Paul Sanctuary charity? You know, what, 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 what's the vision of, of the charity really? We, we have um, a fantastic vision and it, it kind of comes down to really, um, really amazing projects. So one would be to expand our welfare outreach work so that we can do more preventative um, work. So we're not just um, receiving horses in need, that we're actually getting out into the community and helping um, to support equine owners and share what we know and share our knowledge and experience. And, and that involves getting more staff, uh, more vehicles, all the things that go with it. So um, the Southwest is actually a really big area for us to cover. Um, and we, we'd love to sort of cover it more comprehensively. So that's one thing. And I think the, bit, the other really big area of development is, is um, reconnecting horses, nature and people. Um, so our education and therapy programme is just incredible. And the clients that we've, we already had before COVID who were benefiting from the programmes we offer, you know, um, youngsters that were disengaged from school and who are now re were re-engaging with school before COVID um, just through... Uh, us providing professional coaching um, and um, you know um, just just great programs for people who are perhaps vulnerable or facing really difficult times um, promoting sort of well-being uh, through horses um, is a really big area for us um, it's so, yeah. almost similar to the sort of therapy dogs that you have in the, <laughs> on the canine side of things I think uh, the sort of uh, just the spiritual the soulfulness of a horse you know that can uh, i can see how you can sort of almost not harness but share that with someone who needs it and will benefit from it yeah and you know the animal the animals themselves are so intuitive of spotting that mm. in a person mm. um mm. i i've personally experienced it a few times you know it's not often i'm upset but if i am i only have to walk up to the edge of a paddock and um you know a horse will come up to you if they can sense it and it's just they're very intuitive and um you know they're they're just they are really beautiful animals and they're very good at mirroring your your feelings um mm -hmm. and, and being able to relate so yeah they're great don i understand you have got an amazing cat that's oh, a cat yes. the same <laughs> My cat, he is quite good actually. He's good. Um, my 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 young son was upset one day, and uh, Jack, who doesn't really get on him, climbed up on him and lay right here on his chest. So yeah, I think all animals are pretty special, yeah. aren't they? He's sat next I, to me at the I, moment, actually. <laughs> Excellent. No, that's my. He's a pretty cool cat. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks for all this information. It has been fascinating to hear that. So, how would be the best way to uh, connect with uh, yourself or with Marina Polo Sanctuary if anybody who wants to help out in a lot of different ways whether it is financially whether it's time whether it is you know um, how, what's the best way to get to you oh thank you for that um yeah well our website has a lot of the information which is www.marinfoll.org.uk um, but we're also on um, Facebook and Twitter. If you just punch in Marin Foal Sanctuary, you should find us quite easily. Um, one of the things I would encourage is for people to join our mailing list and then we get to send you our amazing newsletters that go out three times a year and they're packed full of all the great stories and all the successes that we've achieved in that in that time period and um you know Meg, megan and myself we pull those together and um, by talking to all the, the grooms and hearing all the different stories and they're just lovely so we'd be able to get to send you those 
Um, and yeah, um, following us on, on social media means you get to see all the films. Like we actually caught the, the births of uh, the foals that I mentioned to you earlier on, on our camera and we shared wow. those through our website and through the social media. So if you just want a bit of a horsey fix, you can also just come and get that from our website and things. So yeah, just, just come online and join our mailing list. And um, if you wish to donate, we've got plenty of, plenty of arrows pointing to the donate button once you get there. So thank you very much. No, well, thank you very much. And I do look forward to uh, hearing, you know, we have a chat again once COVID is over and we'll see how we have changed by then. But you know, the vision that you are having, that Marion Paul is having in terms of education, I do believe that probably is the next stage, is paramount really, rather than just having an ambulance service, so to speak, but actually yeah. empowering uh, horse owners, horse guardians to um, not call you in the first place <laughs> and, you yeah. know, keep the horses over there, but well taken care of. And I think that, that that is also, you know, a, a huge outreach to help um, you know, horse owners. But um, yeah, thank you very much, Don. It's been a you're pleasure. Welcome. Thanks and for I'll having us. <laughs> yeah. it's, you're welcome, you're welcome. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hear what the next story is. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome.